What is going on, YouTube? Remember, if you guys enjoy this video, to like and subscribe for more future episodes. David Grush came forward, former intelligence guy with two former pilots, and testified to Congress. He said he knew from his intelligence work that the government was holding intact craft, alien craft, not of this world. It was being held somewhere secret. He said he would tell Congress where in closed session. And he said there was a Cold War race with the Russians and maybe the Chinese to harvest this technology for defense purposes. He made a lot of very sensational claims and he, he has very good credibility. As we found when we wrote the story of him, we wrote him up before he testified to Congress. We were the first to tell his story. Welcome on the show. Really excited to have you today. Have a ton of discuss, but obviously I first want to highlight brand new book that just came out, UFOs, Mystery in the Sky. So if you can just give a quick introduction, both what the book is about, your background in journalism, and you know how you kind of got into UFOs as a topic. Oh, great. Okay. So um, this is a book my wife and I did. She's a children's book author, Deborah Blumenthal. And um, I have been writing about UFOs for the New York Times, and I had been uh, working for 17 years on the biography of John Mack um, called uh, The Believer. And my wife heard me uh, talking uh, about, you know, heard all my interviews on this. And she one day said, well, why don't we write a book on UFOs together? So uh, I thought that was a great idea. And we merged our expertises. Uh, she's a children's book writer. I'm a New York Times reporter and uh, retired now, but 45 years at the Times. And I had written stories on UFOs for the Times, which we can get to, and written this book on John Mack. So it was a good, um, you know, merging of, of interests. And we thought it, it's important to write a book for young people, a factual book, uh, no aliens, no speculation. It's all fact, um, you know, what can be uh, authenticated so far, beautifully illustrated by a, a very good artist, Adam Gustafson. So that's the story of the book. It came out in March um, or April, I should say, mid-April. And uh, it's just a great way to introduce kids to the a subject. I mean, they're already introduced to it on TV and, you know, they hear stories from their friends, but this is a factual account and it's a way for parents and librarians and teachers uh, to bring up the subject in a very non-judgmental way. And was there, did you guys notice that there was a niche or kind of an opportunity there? Because obviously this topic for decades was so taboo to talk about even if yeah i mean you know, we did not find any aspects. other yeah i mean we, we we could not find any other children's book picture book that that is factual there's a lot of fiction you know a lot of sensation about you know speculation and aliens and stuff but we we found that this was the first um, non-fiction sort of factual account um that that we could come up with so we did feel um, that there was an unexplored, um, you know, niche here. And as I said, a way for parents and teachers to bring up the subject in a uh, non-sensational way. So may I ask, what piqued your interest into UFOs and the UFO phenomenon? Because uh, in my eyes, you're one of the remaining true journalists, someone that looks for the truth. I've done research into your writings all the way back in the 70s. You have a fantastic career. I love the way you approach topics and you know, as you're highlighting with the, even with the children's book, you want to get the truth out there. The same thing for UFOs. And that's not true for everyone. So how did that interest peak there? And how did you take a journalistic approach to it? Um, good question. Uh, as you said, I, uh, it was not really one of my fields at the New York Times. Uh, I did a lot of investigative reporting on political corruption. I uh, covered the arts. Uh, I did a series on Nazi war criminals who had escaped justice, uh, tracking them down. Um, uh, I covered the mafia and uh, organized crime. So uh, a lot of stuff not involving, uh, you know, uh, UFOs at all. But um, in, in 2003, I was in Texas for the New York Times um, and I happened to pick up a book uh, written by John Mack, the Harvard psychiatrist who, um, you know, sort of counterintuitively was investigating UFO accounts because he heard all these stories from 
patients and people who were coming forward to him. Um, and he was brave enough, really, to take on the topic and wonder what, what was it about these accounts of people, you know, encountering aliens and, and UFOs and uh, what was it? Um, it was just so mysterious. So he looked into that and then he wrote a book and he wrote two books. And I happened to pick up the second one called Passport to the Cosmos. As I said, I was the New York Times correspondent in Texas. Uh, nothing about UFOs had ever, you know, crossed my, my, my path. Um, and I thought, gee, this is an interesting story. Harvard psychiatrist who's interested in alien abduction, these accounts of people. And I thought I'd call him up. And a few days later, I picked up the paper and found out he'd been run over and killed in London. Uh, he had won a Pulitzer Prize writing about uh, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, T.E. Lawrence. And he'd been gone back to England to, to in the 30th anniversary of the book. And he was coming. He was tired. He was uh, coming out of the underground station late at night and he looked the wrong way and got run down. A lot of people initially thought, you know, it was an assassination, which is what, you know, what it could have looked like. Um, given his notoriety, but I, I later checked it out and uh, it was, uh, you know, a complete accident. I mean, the guy had had too much to drink, the driver, and Mac was looking the wrong way. Anyway, that got me interested. And I thought there was a good story here. I contacted the family uh, through their grief. I mean, they, they, it was not a good time to contact them. They didn't want to talk. But eventually, um, they did open up his archives to me, and he was a great saver, luckily. Uh, he had a tremendous amount of material, including his own, um, uh, you know, therapy sessions, which psychiatrists have to go through. So he told uh, his his own therapist a lot of stories about his interest, and so I, and a lot of writings, and uh, published and unpublished, and so I did that and interviewed, you know, a lot of people and it took 17 years, but I came out with this book, The Believer. Um, and so that's how I got into it. And then uh, while I was working on that book, um, uh, my colleague, Leslie Kane, uh, a great UFO writer, uh, investigative reporter, uh, came to me with a story about um, some information she had dug up in Washington about a secret um, UFO uh, unit operating in the Pentagon, which was not known at all that they were doing that. They were supposedly out of the UFO business uh, since Project Blue Book at the end of 1969. So uh, she said, "We got there's a good story here that there's a secret uh, Pentagon office investigating UFOs. We got the, the three videos, Navy videos of encounters with Navy jets. And... Um, so, uh, you know, I'm sure I was interested. We brought that story to the New York Times. I still had a lot of contacts there. I, I was uh, off the staff since 2009, but um, we talked to the editors. They, we had the story cold. I mean, all the interviews, everything on the record, no, you know, anonymous sources. And um, so that was our big story in December 2017, that there was a secret UFO unit in the Pentagon. And uh, then we followed that up with a few other stories. But that's really how I got into it. I definitely want to dive into that in a little bit, because, again, that was that's almost what started kind of the snowball effect here. But in general, walking into the office that day, knowing that you're going to be talking about this explosive report about, you know, this hidden kind of Pentagon UFO research center, something that. If it wasn't a true story, everyone wouldn't believe it in the first place. How did it feel to do that shift from, as you were saying, you know, you were covering mafia mob bosses, you were talking about political corruption, all these other topics to shift and in that moment be taking on something so groundbreaking and yet, as I said before, kind of taboo? Well, first of all, we didn't know how groundbreaking it was going to be at that point. Um, I, you know, we looked at it as another story. I mean, you know, after a long career in the news business, you sort of get a feel for what, what is newsworthy. And the fact that there was, um, you know, the government's official line was that it was out of the UFO business. Uh, there was nothing t to it. I mean, it was all mental aberration. These people were mentally ill who reported sightings, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, there was a lot of disinformation, misinformation. Um, 
So to find out that the Pentagon uh, really was studying UFOs and they had actually taken videos of some close encounters. Um, so that was a story. I mean, in anybody's book. And it, it really didn't take much to um, interest the New York Times. We laid it out for first. We laid it out. I sent an email to the top editor and he said, you know, gave the green light. And then we met with another editor who came up from Washington uh, to the New York Times in New York, and we laid it out for him. And then he got the Washington Bureau involved. And uh, the third member of our group was Helene Cooper, who covers the Pentagon defense issues, because we needed somebody who had good access to uh, the Defense Department, because we needed to get, you know, reaction from them. Um, so, um, you know, we didn't realize uh, really till the story came out in December 2017, um, how big it was going to get. Uh, you know, we just sort of did what, what reporters do one step at a time. And then the Times put the story out on the front page on a Sunday, which added to its impact. And um, it, it, was, it was a bombshell. I mean, uh, uh, other papers picked it up quickly. Uh, and um, but I, I didn't get the sense as I was doing it that, you know, this is this is going to be historic. What was the moment that you realized that it had become a public sensation and something that in a lot of ways has really changed the level of disc discourse about UFOs and UAPs in the U.S. and the world in general? Yeah, well, the hits, the hits just kept on coming, as they say. Um, you know, nowadays you can judge the impact of a story unlike when I started in journalism, you know, in the typewriter era, uh, everything is, you know, uh, instantaneous uh, in the internet era. So we could see right away that these, we put out what was three videos that we had gotten access to um, showing uh, th uh, encounters with three objects uh, uh, that were very puzzling. And you could hear the Navy uh, pilots and uh, sailors on a ship, you know, exclaiming about the amazing uh, mysterious quality of these uh, objects that you could see pretty clearly like skipping over the waves and up in the sky like a like a gyroscope um, so um, those videos were among the um, I think the most watched ever in the history of the New York Times so you can track you know eyeballs now so we knew that a tremendous number of people were, were tuning in. And of course, it was all over the other media. We were invited on a lot of shows to talk about it. Um, and um, so we, we realized pretty quickly that um, this had hit a nerve. I mean, everyone was interested. Can you maybe explain ATIP a little bit more in depth for those that might not have had experience of actually being there for um, the initial release of the article? Yeah. So the uh, the name of the agency, the secret, the secret, it was always, always secret, a Pentagon, but it was not classified, by the way. We did not release classified information. But the secret uh, Pentagon office that was investigating UFOs was called the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, ATIP. That was one of its names. It was not the original name. It had gotten a, an, an earlier name um, back to 2007 when it was created with funding from uh, Harry Reid, uh, then the Senate Majority Leader, who, who got interested in the story and, um, and uh, got the Senate to appropriate in so-called black money. I mean, it was not a uh, public part of the Pentagon budget, uh, $22 million uh, to this office. And uh, uh, the money was basically appropriated for Robert Bigelow's um, operation. He was an aerospace entrepreneur um, in Las Vegas who was close to Harry Reid and who had um, designed a lot of high tech, uh, you know, technology, including a um, habitat for the space station, the International International Space Station. So he'd been doing, he'd been interested in anomalous research for a long time. Um, uh, you know, he's very interested in strange things that were happening on a ranch that he he bought um, in Utah, and uh, he was very interested in um, you know UFOs and and these accounts of encounters with with beings and and aircraft and spaceships. So he had the um, uh, 
um, organization, the company, the aerospace company that could use this money to do investigation. So um, he partnered with um, the Pentagon in, uh, you know, setting up research. And uh, um, so eventually the, the office was called uh, ATIP, the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. And the head of it was a guy named Lou, uh, Louis Elizondo, an intelligence guy um, with a lot of uh, experience in high level operations. Um, who was the head of it at the time. But what made the story more interesting um, was that he, uh, Lou Alessandro had just submitted his resignation to Defense Secretary Jim Matt Mattis because he was being blocked by forces in, in the Pentagon who thought this um, whole study was demonic. They didn't want to have any part of it. Um, so he had had enough, Alessandro, and he submitted a... Uh, his resignation. So we had not only the story about the fact that there was this you know, secret Pentagon office investigating UFOs, but there was the human drama of the head of it uh, was resigning because he was being blocked. Um, so there were, you know, levels of the story that made it, you know, even more interesting. Um, so that, that's how that that came about. And uh, and that's the story of ATIP. Why do you think that they were blocking him? I mean, highlighting that, you know, they think the circumstance is demonic, but it's also profound. I mean, the evidence is clear as day. There's something there. So why do you think well, they wanted to try so hard? To you block know, him? as you know, Con, I mean, it's a very strange field. And there are people, there are a lot of skeptics out there. It's fine to be skeptical, but um, you got to, you know, pay attention to the evidence. I mean, to the information. <coughs> The information that has, uh, you know, been produced and can come forward, you can't just be a skeptic and say, I don't believe it. You have to look at the information. Um, so um, so there's a normal, um, you know, resistance to, to these outlandish stories. But, um, um, you know, the Pentagon has had and, and the whole government has had a very difficult relationship with this subject going back you know, to World War Two and right after uh, when, you know, uh, the Cold War, when they were denying, the government was denying uh, these sightings that were widespread. Millions of people were seeing uh, UFOs. So um, the Pentagon, had, I mean, it's a complicated story why the government has taken this, had taken this position. It's changing now somewhat. Um, but uh, perhaps partly because um, they didn't want to panic the population. Um, there was nothing they could do about these things. You can't shoot them down. Uh, you can't prove uh, anything about them one way or the other. So they were very upsetting uh, to people in power and to the American people. Um, so the government uh, took the position that uh, they're going to, you know, uh, stigmatize the whole phenomenon and use um, every opportunity to make to ridicule people with, with sightings. Um, so uh, but it's a good question. Why did they take this position? Because it was not like they were, you know, giving away secret information. No one was asking the government to supply uh, secret, uh, you know, flight characteristics, uh, anything they had learned about the extraordinary um, you know, capabilities of these objects. That, that, that was, is something that remains very mysterious. Maybe the government knows, a, surely the government knows a lot more than it's saying. But, you know, I'm not saying the government should have uh, put out all the information it had, but maybe uh, not made fun of the people who were reporting these things. So, uh, that, that's, you know, what the climate was then, that the government was uh, had decided early on on a policy of stigmatizing the phenomenon. Can you explain Project Blue Book as well? Because that's another combination here mm -hmm. that there was a period where the government was researching this topic. And then the reason this revelation was so profound in, in, in another way was that they pretended like mm -hmm. they locked it out, UFOs aren't there, and then we find out later that they're still doing the research in the background, just 
no longer wanting it, you know, bring it to the forefront or admit that there might be something going right. on. Right. Um, well, as I lay out in my book on John Mack, there, there was a whole series of government programs, investigations, secret, um, or not so secret, actually. Uh, I mean, the, the, some of them were announced um, where they were actually purporting to do investigations went under different names. So one of the names, one of the more famous programs was called Project Blue Book, um, where they studied um, you know, the, the reports of these objects and then and reported on it uh, in, a, in a public report. But the report came out at the end of 1969 and it said basically that um, there was nothing to see here even though there were 701 cases that were officially designated as un, uh, unresolved. In other words, there was no answer. There, there were, look, a lot of the sightings can be explained. We know that. There are, there are aircraft, there are satellites. After satellites started, uh, you know, uh, after Sputnik in 1957, satellites went up into the atmosphere. So there were always satellites flying around. There's atmospheric conditions, clouds. Uh, lights from Earth that are reflected back into the sky. There's a lot of things that are explainable, weather balloons. Um, so, uh, so the government took all these explainable incidents and said, well, you know, we can explain all these things. Well, actually, they couldn't because there were 701 cases when Blue Book uh, finished in, in at the end of 69. Um, that was still unexplained. That's a lot of unexplained cases. Um, so when they eliminate all the things that it could have been, you know, birds, uh, air, aircraft lights or so, they were left with a lot of cases that they couldn't explain. Plus the sightings, when you look at the accounts of what people say, they're very clear. People say, I saw a huge craft with windows and it came within, you know, a couple hundred feet of me. And I mean, people are very explicit. Uh, and th so it didn't look like they were mistaken. They weren't looking at planes or birds. Anyway. Uh, so that was Blue Book. And, um, and before and afterwards, there were other um, uh, and Blue Book actually was the end of the government investigations until uh, ATIP. So you had from the end of 1969 to 2017, um, a period when the government was not officially uh, investigating UFOs, although it was uh, all along. I mean, records that have come out of the Pentagon show that the government never lost its interest um, in UFOs. There was always secret uh, uh, research going on. So, um, but officially, uh, it ended with Blue Book until uh, ATIP. You talked about it a little bit, but there's been a massive <clears throat> shift in terms of the government's stance on UFOs and UAPs and their communication with the public. I mean, we're seeing congressional hearings now with whistleblowers and, you know, in the forefront of the public media sphere. Why do you think the government's perspective has shifted? And with that, do you think the reason that they were covering up in the past was that a fear of the unknown, whether it be technology that's not in our control, maybe China, Russia, country like that, or just the pure fact that it's something that we're so purely outmatched from that there is a worry of chaos there if we allow yeah. it to kind of run in the public mind. Well, I mean, clearly there has been a change uh, because, you know, wh what I like to say is uh, just look at how far we've come from the days when the government denied uh, that there was any validity to this phenomenon at all. I mean, initially they were saying it's all, you know, hallucinations, mental illness, swamp gas, you know, all the ridiculous explanations. Um, so, um, you know, why they changed, first of all, more information has come out. Uh, and we, we're now in a different technological era where everyone has a cell phone, so people are taking a lot more pictures and videos. Um, and, uh, it, but it has been an interesting, you know, progression in terms of more openness. So, um, um, you know, after our 2017 article and a couple of others that came out, um, people in Congress started asking questions. Now, uh, members of Congress were tra traditionally kind of intimidated by the subject because they were afraid that they would be ridiculed uh, by their, you know, political opponents at campaign time. So everyone was afraid to touch this thing. A little by little, members of Congress started asking questions 
um, you know, like, well, what is this phenomenon? Who is studying it? Uh, and um, uh, so uh, there's been, uh, you know, quite a bit of progress in terms of, as you mentioned, congressional hearings. Uh, the, the most uh, um, sensational one was, uh, you know, a few months ago when a fellow that uh, Leslie and I wrote up in the, in the debrief uh, website, um, David Grush, uh, came forward, former intelligence guy with two uh, former pilots, um, and testified to Congress that um, uh, he, he said he knew from his intelligence work that the government was holding um, a, a intact craft, uh, alien craft, not of this world. Uh, it was being held somewhere secret. He said he would tell Congress, you know, where um, in closed session. Um, and he said there was a Cold War race with the Russians um, and maybe the Chinese uh, to uh, harvest this technology for defense purposes. Um, uh, so he, he made a lot of very sensational claims and he, he, he has very good credibility, as we found when we, we, we broke the story of him, wrote him up before he testified to Congress. We were the first to tell his story. And um, so that had a lot to do with it, that uh, people like that with, with good credibility. By the way, credibility is very important in this business. There's a lot of stuff, uh, you know, on the internet uh, floating around, a lot of claims. Um, and we're very careful, Leslie and I, uh, and Helene, when we worked with her, Pentagon correspondent of the Times, to only report what we could um, uh, really uh, find credible and that we could back up, uh, you know, I mean, we, we couldn't prove some of this stuff, but at least we could put names to it. Uh, that's the important thing. It's not anonymous. We check the people out who are telling these stories. Uh, their credentials are very, uh, you know, weighty. They're people with long experience in government. Um, and uh, so, you know, uh, part, part of this kind of reporting is to uh, use sources that you can uh, credit that people can trust. That, that's the thing. Uh, as I said, even though we, 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 we have not seen these craft, Leslie and I, you know, it's, it's classified. You can't just say, I want to see a captured flying saucer. The, the government won't take you there. The members of Congress were turned down when they showed up at a base and said, we want to look and see what you have here. So that's the big problem in this field that uh, uh, almost all the important information is classified. What does that say about government transparency and the topic as a whole that, you know, you'll have whistleblowers coming forward and I'd love to kind of dive into David Grush and some of the other ones that have come forward, just kind of get your perspective on that. But what does it say about government transparency there that without <laughs> members of Congress wanting to go see this crap that will approach these sites and they're quickly shuffled away by, you know, some other levels within the government, within the military. What does that say about the transparency and the fact that we don't have the communication going even for this topic? Well, what it says is that there's no transparency on this topic. <laughs> These are the deepest secrets that the government has. They're deeper than anything else that the government has, including nuclear technology, uh, you name it. Um, um, th these secrets are protected uh, by layers of um, classification. Um, very few people are privy to the information. They are, um, uh, you know, locked away in little special access programs, what we call um, these super secret um, uh, entities in the government. Um, it, 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 it's, this information is even not routinely available to presidents. Uh, some of them have been briefed, we understand, presidents at their own request, um, but not routinely. Um, uh, a lot of the information is held by private contractors uh, who work with um, the Defense Department and who are not privy to uh, or subject to a freedom of information request. So you can't send a, a FOIA request to Lockheed, for example, and say, uh, I want to see documents relating to this, this, and this. Uh, they're not subject to that. The government is, but uh, private contractors are not. Um, so these are the deepest secrets that the government uh, has, and they're protected 
um, really rigorously, certainly through levels of classification. So you, 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 uh, it is illegal to report on, on this information. No one wants to go to jail. Um, um, so um, when you ask about transparency, it does not apply to this field. I mean, what, what is out there is what has has dribbled out what Congress has gotten. By the way, when when uh, we put out the story in the New York Times about ATIP, ATIP was not classified. Um, uh, there are aspects of it that were, I mean, information that it had collected, but the existence of, uh, you know, the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, Lou Elizondo's work, the videos, th those were not classified. We didn't put out classified information because we don't want, we don't want to go to jail. Um, but uh, the, all the important information is classified. So we don't, by the way, the videos that we put out in the New York Times, the three videos, uh, those were just um, uh, excerpts uh, of, of much longer videos. We don't know what's on them. And, and there are many other videos that are classified. These three weren't, but uh, they, they had been made available by Lou Elizondo. He got them declassified or he, um, I don't, I don't want to get into the mechanics of it, but they were not classified. Let's put it that way. But there are other videos that are classified and we can't get access to. So we don't know all the things the government has. We absolutely do not know. Um, and, um, so there, there's a lot to be learned, uh, but it, it's not going to be easy. There are some situations as well with some of these stories, I believe with commander David Fravor, the Tic Tac, where. He said that there was more footage, but it was either taken or confiscated before the footage could actually be incorporated or released or any situation like that. Like, is that true? Is, is that kind of some of the situations we're seeing as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a lot, you know, the, the rest of these videos, what was, what's, what's on the tape before and after, uh, we don't know. Um, <clears throat> there was a story we, we heard that, um, uh, one, one, one of the uh, aircraft carriers involved in, in these incidents uh, um, that officials came on board and confiscated the uh, tapes, the secret tapes of these, you know, um, video encounters. Um, uh, we got that account from different people on the ship um, who saw it happen. They don't know what ha they don't know who these people were who confiscated the information. They don't know what happened to it, who's holding it. Um, so for sure. Uh, this information, uh, you know, there's much more information uh, out there, and um, but uh, it's it's going to be very difficult to get because, uh, as I said, a lot of it's classified. Now, should it all be classified? Because some of it uh, probably has to do with information that our adversaries would like to get. They'd like to know how to fly craft, you know, at these incredible speeds that operate maybe underwater and uh, make you know can stop on a dime, make a U-turn. Uh, have an unknown means of propulsion. Um, so if we have that technology or we have information, uh, that's probably, a, you can make a case, that's a legitimate defense secret that we don't want our adversaries to have. But just to say that these that there is this technology out there that we can't explain, that it's not of this earth, it doesn't belong to China or Russia or any other earthly power to say that that's not giving away defense information that's information that humanity has a right to have to know that there's another intelligence or other intelligences out there in the universe um uh you know just to, to say that doesn't give away any secrets it's something that humanity should know um so you know that's that's how i feel about it what's your perspective on the theory that these could be either adversarial craft or our own black op operation class of just advanced technology that is yet to be released to the public? Well, the, the best people we talk to again and again uh, say that there's no uh, technology uh, like this that uh, we or any of our earthly adversaries possess. These things can, can operate um, at, uh, you know, with aerodynamic capabilities that are just not known on earth. Uh, tremendous speeds, they can go from 80,000 feet down, down to the <coughs> surface of the water in seconds, operate underwater uh, as they've been seen to do. Um, um, and uh, no, no power on earth has this capability. 
Now, you can't disprove a negative. So, you know, you can always say, well, maybe, you know, uh, China, maybe Russia. Ha well, maybe. But all the experts we've consulted say uh, it's beyond the realm of possibility that any power on Earth can de has the capability of uh, producing uh, objects that, that operate like this. Um, and, and if we had that capability, we wouldn't be using it in areas where our own pilots are flying. And, uh, you know, uh, in one case, uh, we wrote up in The New York Times, uh, two um, American uh, j you know, jet pilots were flying um, their, their, their jets um, cl close to each other. And one of these strange objects flew between them really close. Uh, now, you know, uh, um, if we had this technology, it wouldn't be jeopardizing our pilots. Again, it, would, it makes no sense whatsoever. So, um, uh, and again, the ex experts we consult again and again say nobody has this technology on Earth. <clears throat> I'm curious, especially for, you know, how hard you are on credibility. There's one story that oftentimes is brought back up as Bob Lazar talked about the fact that even back in, I believe it was the seventies that the U S had been able to found a, a downed UFO spacecraft had reverse engineered the technology was utilizing it in our systems. What's your perspective on that story as well? And kind of like how it's relevant to some of the cases we're seeing to start getting released today and some of the aircraft as well that we're seeing in the air in these videos. Well, I haven't uh, interviewed Bob Lazar, uh, you know, uh, myself. Uh, I'm sort of familiar with his claims. But uh, David Grush has said something similar. Uh, I mean, Lazar claimed to have seen th these craft actually um, in hangars and, and, you know, touched them and put his hands on them. Uh, Grush has not made that claim. Uh, he said there are people he knows who have and who he will, you know, tell Congress um uh, if they, if, if Congress wants to get in touch with them. So we don't know if they have done that or will do that. Um, but what Lazar said um, does uh, sort of correspond to what Grush has said. Um, again, Grush didn't say he saw these things, unlike Lazar, but um, he said in his, Grush said in his intelligence work, he heard from people uh, with high level connections that we are definitely in possession of uh, pieces of an intact uh, craft, not of, of this earth. So, um, you know, that's all I can say. I, 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 I don't know. I, as I said, I haven't talked to Lazar. I can't evaluate his claims. Again, the, um, th this area is, uh, you know, deeply classified and a reporter can't just go and say, I want to see one of these craft and put my hands on it. Um, so we have to take the, the word of people like uh, Lazar and Grush, um, uh, who have, you know, credibility uh, to hear their stories. So um, that's all I can say about Lazar. From a journalist's perspective, how do you look to separate people based on credibility on such a touchy and in many ways taboo topic that, you know, you'll have some people that are coming in simply for a quick claim to fame, while others who may have genuine experience and genuinely seen something profound? Well, the first thing is we insist on the use of um, a person's name. Um, <clears throat> in one case, in the debrief article, and you know, we took some flack for this, uh, we reported on a guy, <clears throat> Jonathan Gray, who uses that name in his secret work for the government um, but that is not uh, his real name. That's a name that he uses in his work. But he, uh, uh, but it, but it, it is a name. I mean, it, so we didn't take an anonymous source. Uh, in every other case, we insist on uh, quoting people by name. Uh, and uh, for example, in David Grush's case, not only did we use his name, but we reported on people who vouched for him, high-level people in the government. Um, and the military who, who also uh, uh, allowed use of their names. So that's an important indicator. If people will allow use of their names, and, you know, I understand a lot of people don't want to do that. Um, it's scary uh, for a lot of people, especially people in the government still doing this kind of work. They, they don't want to be identified. 
So it's easy to find people who won't be identified saying, but readers don't give those stories the same credibility as knowing who the source is. So if you ask how to judge a person's credibility, first of all, is he or she willing to uh, use their real names, um, open their their record, their military record, so we can check on who these people are. Um, we, we need to know, you know, their service record, their commendations. David Grush, for example, served in Afghanistan. We know all that. We have his service records. We've talked to people uh, for whom and with whom he worked, high level people in the military who allowed use of their names to, you know, vouch for him. Um, so that's a big factor. You check their service record. Uh, is it likely that they had access to this information? Were they in intelligence work? Um, and uh, you, you check them out. Uh, so, you know, we have gotten a lot of information, Leslie and I, from people we know of uh, who may well be telling the truth, but will not allow use of their names. So we don't report their claims um, uh, because uh, our condition is we, we need to uh, we need to know who they are and have on the record who they are so that readers can judge for themselves. Um, so you raise a good question. How do you vet these people? Uh, with great difficulty, I would say. I can definitely agree with that. It's uh, probably one of the most difficult topics to to vet, but I'm glad there's people out there that are actually doing it the proper way. So obviously, thank you for that. With that, we talked a lot about government transparency or just a willingness to actually have this discussion. But there's also been a shift in the professional culture, in academics, in as we're talking about journalism. What do you think that shift's been like? And how do you think that that kind of plays into the role or the opportunity for us to actually explore a lot of these phenomenon? Well, um, you know, the media um, very often has ridiculed this subject um, when they've dealt with it at all. Um, I'm talking about the mainstream media. Um, I mean, um, uh, I like to think that our, our story, December 2017, sort of opened the way for mainstream media to report seriously on the topic. Um, but um, for a long time, this area was relegated to fringe publications um, and, uh, and, and with, with a kind of a smirk. Um, and the New York Times is guilty of this as well, going back, uh, and the Washington Post. And uh, uh, in the Wall Street Journal, I can think of some stories uh, where they made fun when, when they covered it at all. They made fun of the phenomenon. That was a, a very a comfortable way to handle it, to ridicule it. Um, so I think things have changed, um, not totally, but t to some extent. Um, and um, the main thing is to acknowledge that this is, is still an open mystery and nobody pretends to have the answers. For example, um, I don't know, you know, where these things come from, uh, uh, who, who or what is, you know, behind the wheel, um, why they are coming here, why they come the way they come in waves, uh, uh, why so some people see them and other people don't see them. Uh, there's millions of questions and they remain unanswered. Um, so the, the only common sense um, approach to this is to acknowledge that this is a big mystery, but it is an authentic mystery. In other words, it's not explainable uh, away by saying, oh, these people are crazy or it's a hallucination or it's hoax. These people are looking for publicity or it's a hoax. It's not any of those things. Um, not all of them anyway. Some, to some extent, they have been hoaxes, they have been fabrications, they have been mistakes, you know, all kinds of things. But uh, uh, there is no explanation that explains all of it um, and explains it away as a, as a completely natural phenomenon. Um, so we have to acknowledge it. Uh, we have to acknowledge that. That's the most important thing to start off by saying, this is a mystery. We don't have the answers, but that's what science does. It goes after things it doesn't understand and tries to explain them. And uh, the so, you know, so-called skeptics or scientists who say, well, this is impossible. How could they come from, you know, the far corners of the universe and millions of light years away? You know, that no creature could even survive that time. Well, <laughs> that's true. Um, uh, it doesn't fit into our uh, uh, concept of physics as, as we understand it. But um, 
but they as I said, we have to acknowledge that there's a mystery here, but at least we also have to acknowledge that the um, evidence that has come out, and I will call it evidence because it's, um, it's strong pieces of information that uh, is hard to, that are hard to um, uh, deny uh, sightings by reputable people in daylight. It doesn't only happen at night, uh, but daylight, uh, close encounters, um, how do you, uh, you know, explain that all the way? You can't. You have to say this is a mystery, but at least the information seems solid. I'd be interested in hearing your perspective, too, on some of the academics that are connect connecting this to some of the ancient societies we've seen or just, you know, that they are these sightings, these beings have been here for much longer than we may originally thought. I know the debrief did a great piece on uh, RV Lobov's research into an aircraft or, or an possible UFO that might be at the bottom of the ocean, which was a really fun piece to follow <coughs> along with. I'll link that below. If you want to speak to that a little bit, it was awesome. But in general, there's starting to be that conversation as well. So what's your perspective on that and kind of the connection that these might have been here a lot longer than <coughs> we originally thought? Well, the accounts of... Uh strange objects, uh, as you know, go back to prehistory or, or ancient history. Uh, there are accounts in the Bible and the Upanishads and all kinds of, um, you know, ancient literature of unexplained things. Now, they, they're often, uh, um, you know, cited back then in terms that are um, co uh, consistent with the culture of the time. So in the Bible, it's the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, we, the uh, fiery wheel or chariots in the sky. They didn't say automobiles, you know, back in the biblical days. They said chariots because they didn't know about automobiles. Um, so, um, but the, certainly uh, accounts go way back. And in my book on John Mack, I talk a little bit about the very strange accounts in the, in the late 1800s uh, before uh, the Wright brothers um, of uh, heavier than aircraft that was supposedly seen by a lot of people around the, the United States. And by the way, this phenomenon is not just limited to the U.S., it's worldwide, but we have maybe some of the better or best reporting. So you, you keep hearing these accounts, but it's certainly not limited to the U.S. But anyway, um, um, so there's certainly, uh, you know, hundreds of years and maybe thousands of years, uh, accounts go back of things that, that people saw in the sky that they could not explain. Um, and, um, um, and I missed the second part of your question now about, uh, um, what was it you said? There was Avi something. Loeb, Ops. I know oh, Avi Loeb. Uh, yeah, I have a great regard for Avi Loeb. I, I appeared at his Harvard a group uh, a couple months ago, I gave a talk about my research um, uh, as a journalist, and um, <clears throat> his latest expedition was very interesting. He went to uh, the ocean off New Guinea and uh, her, where some object supposedly plunged in, and they found um, little spherules, round residues of, of, of some uh, solid object. Um, that they're having analyzed. And the question is, uh, does this material correspond to material on Earth? Um, so uh, I understand that there's no definitive answer yet, but it's certainly, they did recover against, um, against all odds, actually, considering that they were, you know, uh, combing the bottom of the ocean floor off New Guinea, a special area that they, uh, you know, had, had zeroed in on, that they actually found um, uh, some metallic residues there. So, um, and as you know, he also uh, wrote about uh, Uamuamua, which was a, a, an object that um, nobody really saw. I mean, it was in and out of the solar system before anybody knew what it was. Um, I think it was 2000. It was around the time of our article. It was either 16 or 18, 2000. But it was the last few years. And um, by different uh, astronomical measurements, it seemed to have uh, picked up speed at a time when a normal meteorite or an asteroid couldn't do that. So... The hypothesis was that it was using some kind of a light sail or some kind of technology to speed up its its trajectory. 
Um, if so, then it, it might not be a natural object. It might not have been a natural object. It's now way, you know, gone into the solar, into the solar system and the rest of the universe, but uh, it just passed through. Um, uh, the, the artist renditions make it look like a, 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 a sort of a hunk of rock, but we don't know what it looked like. Uh, uh, nobody saw it. I mean, they just detected its presence uh, afterwards. Anyway, uh, but I have high regard for Avi Loeb. I think he, he has suffered some of the same attacks as John Mack uh, before him at Harvard. Mack was a psychiatrist, very different discipline. Uh, uh, Avi Loeb is an astrophysicist. Um, but they both contend with uh, people who attack them uh, because they <clears throat> don't understand what, what these people are trying to do. Um, you know, they're, uh, you know, holding on to their belief system that this is not possible, you know, this is demonic, <laughs> um, all these things. But a true scientist uh, goes with the information and tries to figure out, you know, what's behind it. So, uh, as I said, I, I, I hold him in high regard. And ending with that, you've talked about in your writings before, you've discussed skeptics and believers and how you navigate this balance and without alienating one side or another, without leaning too hard into a believer and too hard into a skeptic. If you had to end this with saying something to both a skeptic and a believer, what would that thing be in terms of having them come to a conclusion or kind of a common space in terms of talking about this topic? Well, the first thing I would say is do your homework. I mean, I, I went through an enormous amount of material for my book, uh, The Believer, um, and I don't have the answers, <laughs> you know, uh, but I know what the questions are. Um, so what I object to in the so-called skeptics is that they have a ready answer. Oh, it's sleep paralysis. You know, these people are just having nightmares and they see these uh, alien beings um, in their dreams and then they think it's real. Well, some of these, many of these incidents don't only happen at night. They happen when people are in broad daylight walking in the fields or, um, you know, driving a car or doing other things. So if you're going to be a skeptic, do it from the point of view of um, the information that's available. And there's a lot of information available, a tremendous amount of accounts now by ordinary people. And this is what struck John Mack. Uh, these people come from all walks of life. Um, they're professionals, they're blue collar people, they're young, they're old, some children two years old um, who have not been to the movies and not read books about UFOs. They're just telling things that they say they've seen. Little man, take me up into the sky. Um, so um, if you're going to be a skeptic, be aware of all this information and, 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 and account for it. And if you can't account for it, say that. Say that <clears throat> we don't know, which is what I say. Uh, all we know is that um, there's a lot of very puzzling information out there and things that do not lend themselves to, um, you know, a, a quick solution or any solution that we can understand. So um, that's that's the first thing. We, we need a lot of humility in this thing. But um, we've got to acknowledge that there are some really puzzling accounts out there. And the technology is, um, you know, Navy instruments have, have captured some of it. Um, so we know it's real. And this is the big breakthrough. The government is now saying that these things are in all probability real. In other words, they're not uh, hallucinations. They're not mistaken weather balloons or birds. Uh, there's something up there and in the water um, that we don't understand. Uh, we have no answer for yet, uh, but um, it's, it's authentically mysterious. And I think that's the best we can do at this point. Well, Ralph, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. I know we talked a little bit about John Mack and uh, RV Law and the way that they are really taking a risk by putting themselves out there, but also, even though it's a risk, they're really making a massive change. And I would put you in that same camp. Seriously, everything you've done for the UFO phenomenon, for being willing to take a step out there and actually help people not only know what's going on, but actually be able to know what's going on from the truth. 
So with that, I just want to say thank you and thank you for coming on today. Thank you. A great pleasure. What a crazy episode. I hope you guys did enjoy. And remember, if you did and you made it this far into the video, might as well subscribe or follow for more episodes just like this in the future. See you guys in the next one.